there will be a one minute reminder. At the five minute mark, the microphone will be automatically muted. After all those who wish to speak have done so, the floor will open for questions and answers with a similar three minute rule. Dr. Argentieri will make concluding remarks after the question and answer period. I will now try to set the example by kicking off the discussion with a quick intro for under five minutes. I am sure that many of you will do a great job discuss discussing the legal and political ways that these elections have been historical and unique. So I will steer away from that. And instead, I, will, I would like to give a few broad strokes observations of what I believe are the wider societal transitions underway. These societal transitions underpin many of the political divisions we have been witnessing, and they can be described as, first, a transition away from political parties as representative of ideological beliefs to parties as representative of biological identities. Of course, this is not an overt nor formal position of the parties, but it has been amplified by a media quick to promote stereotypes, and it is starting to take on deep psychological meaning for many voters. It may not be the case for many of us here, but many US voters increasingly reason, this party will defend me as fill in the blank, instead of this party will represent my ideas or beliefs on fill in the blank. This development historically has been a precursor to political violence and social unrest. Second, the parallel expansion of two distinct ecosystems of mass media that are in a de facto state of incommunicado. On the one hand, an institutionally owned and endorsed system of news media, social media, and professional network-based public conversations, of which this very event is a part. On the other hand, a decentralized and unruly system of fringe opinions, unconventional beliefs. The second system hacks the first, as in its former's infrastructure, but without the former's sanction. Like an immune system fighting off a virus, the official system finds itself scrambling to discredit, disqualify, and deplatform the hackers. It is an interesting development that the current president of the United States is now officially a hacker posting what a Twitter algorithm qualifies as misleading and incorrect information. A civil servant, legally if not emotionally, represents the entire nation, from which he or she gets his or her mandate. A private entity is mandated by its shareholders. This public-private tension over the public discourse will not be easy to figure out. Third and lastly, a silent yet profound division over the role of the Constitution, and in particular, between those that champion unalienable rights versus those that champion positive rights. Unalienable rights are those that cannot be taken away by government, right to speech, faith, happiness. Positive rights are those that government should proactively give to individuals, right to shelter, food, safety. The balance between the two defines the role of the state and the very meaning of freedom. Freedom from the state alongside freedom guaranteed by the state. Both have a role to play in our modern social contract. Too much freedom from the state can lead to chaos, injustice, exploitation. And too much freedom guaranteed by the state can lead to tyranny as it opens to struggle for power over control of those freedoms. Yet when half of society only sees and cares about their unalienable rights and the other half only sees and cares about their positive rights, it no longer becomes a matter of how to mix the two, but of pitting the one against the other. Getting this balance right is possible when both sides see the value of the other side. I believe we are not just witnessing a historical election, but a redefinition of the social contract. And it is an honor to be with you all here to discuss it. So I would like to turn over the floor to the first person that has asked to speak. I see a message from Powell. Powell, would you like to, to um, have the floor? If so, please, uh, please unmute yourself and, and your video.
Powell, are you are you out there? All right. Um, is there anybody else? I'm I'm looking at my chat and I and I don't see any messages. So unless you want me to go on for another minute, which I which I guess is better not. Ah, yes, uh, Diego, Diego Pagliarulo. Yes, please, uh, please, uh, please yes. introduce yourself. And uh, there we are. Yeah, my name is Diego Pagliarulo. And I am a lecturer in political science at John Cabot University. Uh, I find I, I think this is a very important topic, and I thank you uh, very much for uh, organizing this event. First of all, and um, just a few observations. Uh, uh, perhaps a you know it's too early for a positive note, or maybe it's uh, what is needed. But uh, uh, the fact is, is that it seems to me that um, the situation you have. Uh, 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 at the moment in the United States, it's, um, it's actually how the United States works in a certain way. Uh, so if we look at American history, we find that there are moments, you know, American history usually proceeds as uh, a series of cycles of uh, economic development that, that generate enormous wealth that comes out uh, to be very unevenly distributed. And this gives rise to uh, populist uh, uh, upheavals, but usually those populist upheavals are followed by um, great seasons of uh, reform. This is what we have seen with, you know, uh, the first American Republic basically finished, you know, ended up in a um, in the Civil War, but the Civil War was then, uh, uh, you know sold by um, a, you know, uh, Lincoln, the 13th Amendment, and along with the 13th Amendment, the Homestead Act and the Merrill uh, Land Grant, uh, the Morrill Land uh, Grant uh, College Act, for example. We can go on with the Reconstruction. This is the era that gave rise to the robber barons, and but it also gave rise to uh, the uh, reformers such as Teddy Roosevelt and uh, Woodrow Wilson. And then we see the same thing happens with the Gilded Age in the, in the Roaring Twenties. And then we have the New Deal. So we do have this kind of uh, cycles in American history. And clearly, we may argue that we are facing another round of this kind of development. We have seen huge, um, mm, you know, mm, the, the United States, the American economy has changed enormously uh, because of globalization and technological change, uh, some innovation in finance. This has created enormous wealth that, again, has been very unevenly distributed. We see that, you know, a few people in the United States, the top 0.1% uh, in the United States is uh, enormously wealthy. And, uh, but if we look at uh, wages, uh, for ordinary Americans, they haven't, uh, they've have been stagnating for decades right now. So we can explain, for example, the Trump phenomenon in this way, and we see an America that is very, very polarized. But my feeling is that the big uh, question concerning uh, what's going on right now and the prospect of the United States is where, when will this new era of reforms uh, uh, begin. Maybe, you know, uh, Biden does have this great opportunity and the Democrats have this great opportunity right now, especially if they win the two uh, extra Senate seats uh, in January. And uh, so, you know, uh, it's a very, it's been a very troubled uh, four years uh, seen from Rome, but uh, frankly, there is, uh, you know, uh, the United States remains all the element that made uh, the United States uh, a, the, the largest economy in the world, uh, a very dynamic uh, society, our, a powerful country, and somewhat a force of good uh, in the world are still there. Uh, the thing is whether someone will manage to harness them and bring the, kind of lead the country forward. Th that's it for, for the time being. Thanks very much for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Diego, for um, speaking under four minutes, um, and I appreciate your your comments. Um, we we don't have any any additional 
messages of people wanting to speak uh, unless anybody wants to be uh, brought up closer to the top of the queue. Maybe Angela? Sure, I can speak. Hi, everybody. I'm coming to you from, as you can see, um, rural Ohio. I am uh, the director of the Center for Slavic and East European studies at Ohio State University and a professor there of Russian literature and culture. Uh, but I also live pretty far from the state uh, from the state capital of Columbus uh, out in the sticks, as you can see. So um, I have been actually on a, a news block out since Tuesday. Uh, I, I chose uh, not to follow uh, the uh, vagaries of uh, vote counting. Uh, and there's a very good reason for that. And I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but one of the things that I did do was cancel class on election day and go become a poll worker, which I thought was really, really uh, not only a super interesting thing to do, something I had never done before, but also I think maybe a very, very important thing to do that maybe I will do every year uh, now that I know how to do it. And that actually is my first point that uh, in the county where I live, Green County of Ohio, um, I sent in many, many requests to become a poll uh, worker and was given the opportunity on Saturday uh, morning, I got an email. Would you like to read these 12 PowerPoint slides and come be a poll worker, take a test on them? So uh, I went. I went to a rural uh, polling place where I was one of probably 20 uh, poll workers, of whom probably 14 of us were completely incompetent. Um, we had some really. It's very, very complicated. The voting process, um, the machinery is very complicated. The um, uh, the process by which the precincts are determined, which precincts got, a lot of precincts got moved together because of the pandemic, which complicated things. People didn't know where they were supposed to go. They were in the wrong place. They had the wrong address. They had gotten married and they hadn't changed their name. We had provisional ballots and paper ballots that we were trying to negotiate. And most of us had no idea actually what we were doing. Um, the other really interesting thing I discovered by being a poll worker is that in American life, we don't identify ourselves by party. You can tell nowadays by people's yard signs, but you don't walk around identifying yourself by party in your daily life. And I had to have a sticker on me that get, told them what my party was, told everyone because there are a number of tasks that have to be bipartisan. If you're gonna walk up to a polling machine and help somebody interpret what's going on, which sometimes you have to do because it's actually somewhat complicated. Um, you need to go up as a bipartisan team. To open and close those machines, you need to lock them, uh, sign them with your name and your party affiliation. Um, uh, you need to have people sitting at the provisional table and the paper ballot table who are advising uh, people on a bipartisan basis. Uh, so it's a really interesting experience uh, for, you know, we are obviously a bipartisan at this point getting more and more divided, uh, but we we're not usually a people who walked around in our daily lives identifying ourselves by our party affiliation. So that was a little bit odd. Um, another task that had to be done on a bipartisan uh, basis was curbside voting, which again is not, not something I have ever heard of before. I think it's a pandemic thing. Um, so people had to suit up in PPE with, a, with an iPad uh, to the car of people who A, couldn't walk in or B, refused to put on a mask. Um, there was very little social distancing at our polling place because we were fairly disorganized. Um, we did require masks. There were probably only a few people, um, four or five that I saw who weren't wearing them during the course of the 15 hour day, which is another interesting thing about our polling uh, system that if you are an electoral worker, you must be there the entire time, which can be from five in the morning until whenever, you know, you have to stay open as long uh, as somebody is in line 30 in, in Ohio, um, you have to stay open and then you have to close the poll. So it's a lot, it's a long day um, and it's an interesting day. Uh, the interacting with other people was really interesting. Interacting with the voters was really interesting. I would definitely say that there were several, um, I'm not gonna say how many, but I would say that I can identify a number of votes that I do not legitimate um, simply. And I hope, I'm sure that they, I hope that they were fixed at the, at the uh, Board of Elections uh, when we got after all the votes were moved. One more minute, I wanted to share. Okay, I wanted to just share two quick pictures um, to show uh, what, let's see if I can do this, uh, to show you um, two things. One, antiquated laws, just to that point, um, that 
Let's see if I can do this. There we go. Uh, at the end of the day, this is what we had to do. We had to print second reports on all of the machines and post them externally after we closed the doors, um, which I found just fascinating. So those are plastic bags full of the voter, of the vote record. Uh, and then the second thing I wanted to show if I could, just again, coming to you from rural Ohio, where I think perhaps we are, our future may go, hang on one second, um, I hope. At any rate, this is a picture from um, my town, Yellow Springs, Ohio. It's supposed to be a picture from there, sorry. Angela, there I'm go. sorry, we're, at, we're a bit over five minutes. Okay, there you go. Um, I'm just talking about outsider influence. I really do think that outside voices, voices outside the party is where we're gonna go. That's where our future lies. And this is um, from Dave Chappelle's uh, live from New York, it's Saturday night, the post-election wrap up. So thank you, I apologize for taking too long. Thanks, Angela. Stuart, you're next in line. Hi, everybody. Eduardo, thank you for uh, hosting this. And I want to welcome our uh, everyone from uh, Italy at John Cabot University. Um, thank you so much for, for having this event. Um, I don't have a prepared comment, but I guess one thing I think interesting about the title is we're talking about low, uh, I think you call it low, low turnout and deep divide. Um, I do. You know, Sorry. High turnout and deep divide, I mean. Um, and I guess for me as a workplace psychologist, um, we often look at how cynicism creates people to drop out and lose interest in their organization. However, when you look at the trust level, like for example, we talk about the election and people not trusting it and trusting the, vote, the process or trusting the institutions or assuming the other, other sides are only in it for their own uh, purposes. That's all cynicism. However, there's also a high level of engagement. People are not saying, oh, um, we can't trust our institutions, so I'm not going to participate. People are saying, we don't trust the institutions, and I better participate. So that's kind of a different type of, uh, very different than what happens, let's say, in organi organizations. This is our culture. So I guess what I'm wondering is um, how we move forward as a nation in a time where people don't trust the institutions uh, that are that are supposed to sort of be the um, referees, uh, the vote counters. And to me, everyone says this is a very smooth election. Things went smoothly. And I'm, I, I, I sort of wish if, if I went back in time, besides buying more Lysol at the beginning of the pandemic, I wish we put more emphasis on making sure all of our voting systems were as clean as possible. Our post office was was as a, a very well-oiled machine, and all these things that could have be creating doubt among among especially the, the Trump supporters now, so that we don't end up in this situation. Um, but I just think it's it's a, a very interesting dynamic where we have such high cynicism yet high high engagement, and that's where I'm going to leave it with that. And I'm wondering how we get out of it. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Viviana, would you like to go next, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I, um, and I live in Milan, but I was just in the United States for about um, uh, two weeks, and uh, I traveled uh, through Florida, um, Michigan, and Georgia. And um, uh, some of the things that um, you know you guys said before me made me think because it's true that you know I saw. Um, uh, after the election, um, this incredible um, level of distrust uh, among Republicans. Um, uh, every Republican I met, whether it was, you know, in, in front of the CNN Center, where two armed groups of Biden supporters and Trump supporters were kind of on two different um, 
sides of the road kind of say, saying, you know, we have guns because we have to protect democracy, uh, whether it was, you know, in, you know, inside the Clayton County, um, um, you know, center of operations where they were counting the votes uh, that flipped Georgia from, from Trump to, uh, to Biden during the night. Um, and, and there I, I saw observers who were, um, also some of them were not very aware of the whole process. They didn't know exactly what it is that they needed to observe and they would notice things that they, they would think, you know, maybe they are right, maybe they are wrong. But um, there was a, a young guy, 23 year old uh, head of the local Republican party who was explaining to all of the other volunteers of both parties what was happening because sometimes they didn't know and I noticed how at some point one of the people who were um, tasked with um, uh, understanding whether the votes that the machine had brought up as problematic they, there were three people, a panel, they were supposed to decide whether the vote was to be accepted or not. And one of them was writing down the names of the, uh, the numbers, sorry, of the ballots, and the other two forced him to throw them away to, you know, so it was very interesting process to observe this. But even then, you know, where people were talking and they were not fighting and there were no guns but you know the the republican guy said to me um i don't think the process is fair and um what stewart just said made me think too because in georgia you had uh, an election that uh, there was the one where stacy abrams lost that in the eyes of democrats was a stolen election uh, because of several reasons, you know, and I'm not going to go into them, but that motivated uh, Democrats to go vote this time in numbers that were never, were, you know, were, ne were not before. And I'm wondering whether the belief that the election now is stolen uh, by Trump supporters in Georgia will make them go to the to vote in the in the two um, um, elections they have now for the Senate more than the Democrats because you know those two elections will decide who has control of the Senate. So it is interesting how there is this level of distrust. Um, I, I saw today the Economist had a poll that said 86% of Republicans think that the election was not fair, and yet at the same time um, I don't know I. I do. I, I don't think that as an as an outside observer, uh, I don't think uh, pessimistically, even though, you know, the task of bringing unity, uh, as Biden says, uh, might be quite hard. Thank you, Viviana. Dean Gibson, would you like to go next, please? Yes, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. I, just to follow up on uh, the comment from our uh, colleague in Ohio, I lived in Ohio myself for a while and now I'm from Pennsylvania, and I can tell you I've worked the polls many times, both inside and outside, and my daughter is an attorney who uh, does voter protection, so she's been involved in this pretty, uh, pretty deeply with all the challenges that are happening. The one point I wanted to bring up, just in relation to everything else, was this is a, uh, a quote I heard a few years ago, but recently, from someone in uh, the UK who said, in the UK, the government fears the people. In the United States, it's the other way around. And I think that that underlies some of the things that people are saying here, that in the United States, sometimes uh, the people fear the government. And uh, that's, uh, that's part of the issue of uh, what's been happening, I think, greatly uh, recently with this divide that we have. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kuroda, you're next. Chico, you're still muted. No, I didn't raise my hand. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I, I sent a message, message to you. Yeah. Would you would you like to make make that observation? Okay. Uh, we we don't have any speakers uh, uh, that have uh, that have asked me to to speak. So maybe I can ask some of our advisors from the Gurney Institute maybe to, to jump in at this point. Or uh, Conrad, uh, I see you sent a message. Please take the take the floor. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, 
I'm an administrator at Mercy College. Thank you for, uh, uh, for putting this on. I want to strike an optimistic tone because I think too much of what we see in the media and even what we're discussing here is the divide in the United States. But there's some very positive messages coming from this election, regardless of which side won back. And first is the very high levels of participation, which indicates that democracy is alive and well in this country. And I would also point out that I think as a whole, even though we had, uh, you know, there, there was a lot of polarization, I think on the whole, if you look at the overall results of the election across the board, House, Senate, and the presidency, that Americans have overall taken a middle of the road course and opted for divided government. And divided government means that sides will have to negotiate with each other and it will not be dominated by one side or the other. So for example, now that uh, the Republicans have won the Senate seat in Alaska, as well as North Carolina, there's two seats in play in Georgia. Georgia is traditionally a Republican state. The Democrats have made inroads, but they face a, a big uphill battle in winning both Senate seats. But even if they did, and it was a 50-50 split in the Senate, with the vice president able to cast the deciding vote, you have Senator Manchin from West Virginia, who is a fairly conservative Democrat, who has said that he will not endorse uh, packing the court or taking any of those extreme measures. So the point is, that the American people seem to have spoken. They seem to have chosen Joe Biden over Donald Trump, but as a whole, in the House and in the Senate, they seem to have struck a middle course, which may overall be good for the country. So I wanna strike a positive tone, whereas in many cases, people talk about the polarization, the deeply divided country, but I think Americans as a whole have opted for the middle course. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. Eric, you're next. There we go, just had to unmute. Uh, thanks, yeah, my name's Eric Terzwell. I'm on the Guarini Advisory Board. I'm currently teaching at American University in, in Washington, but spent many years as a US diplomat actually serving in Tiraly in Italy. Um, and so I, I found myself in that uh, diplomatic guise, I often found myself um, trying to explain uh, the United States to foreign interlocutors with great difficulty. I have to say much of the time, the uh, electoral college just doesn't make much sense to anybody uh, outside the US, I confess. But um, I think what Conrad just said was, was extremely interesting and that it's worth bearing in mind when you think of outside observers uh, of the US looking at this. The, one of the, in fact, one of the important things to remember about the United States is that it is not a parliamentary system. So uh, we are in fact, not only quite accustomed to having situations in which our parliament is at least in part controlled by a party different from that which controls the executive branch, i.e. the presidency. But it is certainly true that this is, is a, a, an approach that many Americans feel comfortable with. It sort of draws precisely on this idea that, well, we want everybody checking on everybody else and uh, limiting the power that anybody can exercise. Now, I, I, I do, I just have a question. I'm not uh, necessarily arguing with Conrad here, but uh, I do question exactly to what extent this sort of division of power checks and balances um, approach might have really been at play in the electoral choices a lot of people made. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for data. I will be looking for more data on this. Um, just the other thing I wanted to do, though, was come back to the extremely important things that Angela Brintlinger had to say from uh, regarding her experience at the polls, working the polls. So let's 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 step back here for a second. Here is a very highly educated American, uh, an American who's obviously has civil civic powerful civic commitments and so forth, and then you know, by her own admission, uh, you know, most of the people that, who were working the polls really had no idea what was going on. Uh, and this is, this, is worth, this is worth pausing on a moment. And I think it is in, a, I think a part of the problems we're experiencing at this point in understanding the election results is frankly a very low 
level of baseline knowledge among the American public about how voting actually takes place. Uh, and particularly once you get beyond walking into the polling place, casting your vote and assuming that it's been registered, when you get into something like mail-in ballots or provisional ballots, uh, this seems to utterly confound people uh, and helps breed the sort of suspicion, if you will, that we've been talking about. I think this argues for making, frankly, more of an effort than we have in recent decades with respect to uh, civic education, the old fashioned civics courses that uh, tried to explain how government and public administration functioned, how the United States was organized and so forth, were actually a pretty darn good thing. And uh, I think this is something that would, we should be emphasizing more from you know, early on in the educational process. I will stop there. Thanks, Eric. Um, Angela asked to follow up and then we'll have Lucia next. Uh, I just wanted to add, thank you, Eric, that one of the things that I found fascinating was that um, when you add in the complexity of both paper ballots and provisional ballots and also these machines, you really need um, competence and competence is hard to come by. Any of you know, if you learn how to do something at work, um, within six months, you'll forget. And if you have to do it seven months later, you no longer remember the process of how to do it because it was something complicated on your computer or whatever else. And because uh, in many cases in the US, uh, elections and primary elections in March were canceled. And in Ohio, they were canceled. Um, so those machines were all ready to go in March and didn't get used, which meant that anybody who did know what they were doing on those machines hadn't done it for a year. And that's part of the problem is that we do need uh, competence uh, and training, and we are simply understaffed. Um, the volunteers didn't get trained in time, even the volunteers who uh, didn't necessarily have the, the, the history. And those people who have the history were older, they'd forgotten, they hadn't done it recently, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing that I found really interesting and really important for the American election is, this, is, is the need to trust each other. They need to trust each other across parties. They need to trust each uh, election officials. I unfortunately, um, pretty quickly at my polling place became the most competent person in the room, simply because I'm tall and I speak clearly and I looked at the instructions and thought things through logically out loud. And all of a sudden I was being called all the time to weigh in on things that I had no idea what the answer was. So um, certainly I am intending to become better trained and more competent, um, but I also would like to see more of my fellow Americans who have those uh, qualities going out there and being in the polls as well. Thanks a lot, Angela. Lucia, you're up next. Okay, thank you and greetings everybody from Columbia, South Carolina. So what I can say so far, we, we, we are here to talk about uh, I turn out and I divide. Both are present in this election. Uh, I disagree with Diego, first thing I can say. We don't have an I turn out and an I divide because of the economy. For once, uh, the economy is too, it's the economy is stupid. Remember the Clinton very famous slogan of 20 years, 30 years ago now. I don't think that this is the point. We don't have to look to the Bernie Sanders rhetoric of this 1% of billionaires. I see a divide that is built on cultural reasons. I see a clash between the multi-ethnic and the multi -soci and multicultural society. For what is worth my opinion, we have to look into this kind of problem in the clash between the melting pot model and the salad bowl model. Uh, Trump is the product of this divide, the clash that we saw every day in our television, in our newspaper, in, in the normal debate about the people at the end is the clash about uh, these two models of integration that uh, are um, very much in this moment uh, in crisis, I think both. Um, this is my first point. Second point is to Conrad. I agree with you about uh, uh, Joe Minchin, for example. I agree about he's from West Virginia and is a moderate Republican. But what can we say about Susan Collins? 
uh, would you be so much surprised if one day maybe uh, Joe Manchin vote against the something proposed by Biden, but Susan Collins, who is a Republican from Maine, votes in favor? I mean, mm, I wouldn't overestimate the idea that there is a convergency between Democrat and Republican in this moment. I, wouldn't, I think we don't have to overestimate the idea that there is not such a big polarization just because we, got for a, we went for a divided government. Because in, in addition to that, what is the divided government? We were waiting for Biden winning with a avalanche in maybe 40 states. He is winning with a rather thin and very controversial majority. In the meantime, the House, the Democrat lost five seats, seat, the Republican gained six. Uh, the same about the Senate. They were waiting for the Re Republican to go uh, maybe to 40, 45, maybe less. Instead, they are probably going to finish at 51 to 49, if I have to make a forecast. What about the governors? The Democrats lost another governors. They go from 26 to 24, they go to 27 to 23, a third. So we are in a situation in which we have been looking a president who has been accused in the last four years of everything was possible, economy in crisis, the epidemic, the pandemic all across the country. And, and then this guy is getting five million vote more than four years ago. And in the meantime, about polarization again, uh, like somebody else said before, something like uh, vast majority of Republicans don't see any legitimacy in the Democrat victory. So I don't really see a lot of reason for optimism in this moment, actually, especially because Biden, in my opinion, is just uh, doing close to nothing to bring the country together. Because in this moment, knowing that vast majority of Republicans don't believe in what is the outcomes of the polls, instead of claiming victory, I would be more prudent and waiting until the exhausting of these improbable legal cases, legal suit launched by Trump, instead of putting other gasoline on the fire and claiming to be the president elect only a few hours after that the justice was asking to Pennsylvania to segregate vote coming from mail. I mean, I don't really see him moving in the direction that he said that he want to do, that he, to, to move. Mm, I think I'm taking too much advantage of my, of, of your attention in this moment. I would like to give back the floor to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you. You're well under five minutes, Lucio. Um, um, Saul, would you like to like to um, join in? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll I'll borrow some of Lucio's moments, uh, perhaps. Uh, so um, uh, first, I want to say, especially in the presence of our Italian colleagues, that uh, my fervent hope in uh, November of 2016, waking up to another um, uh, nightmare uh, one morning, was um, that uh, well. Maybe this will just be a chapter like uh, Berlusconi, except um, with the atom bomb. Not very uh, great uh, aspiration, but I thought, okay, so uh, maybe it'll it'll just sort of uh, calmly, uh, with a few, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, Cuban missile crisis type moments. Uh, the four, next four years will pass. Uh, I think we were all uh, disappointed to find out that. Um, uh, maybe this uh, guy is uh, a t total buffoon, but uh, um, less uh, um, uh, uh, has has had had more at his uh, had more at his grasp to um, to, to meddle with, uh, and meddle meddle he did. So uh, here we are, seventy one million uh, votes for a person uh, who. Um, has changed parties, polit uh, political parties seven times in his life, um, uh, directed the Republican um, uh, convention, uh, such as it was this past summer, to have no platform, no platform whatsoever. They stood for nothing. They stood for nothing except for the figure at the top, right? That was, uh, that was, a, uh, that was made explicit. So the question is, why do 71 million people aside from uh, the typical things that drive people to the Republican party, such as, uh, 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 utility optimization gone wild, uh, uh, otherwise known as greed. Um, 
uh, xenophobia, uh, and, uh, you know, a, a paltry uh, few um, policy concerns, most of which they have uh, extremely little attachment to, um, and are willing to change as the winds blow, when we saw that during the, 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 this current administration. Uh, why do people like this guy? I mean, one of the common uh, 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 responses is, well, he was on TV. Right? He was, a, he was a, for our Italian uh, friends, he was a, uh, a rather shoddy uh, reality television uh, personality for a number of years and uh, they had tremendous ratings. And uh, so a lot of people knew him only by that in 2016, only by that. Right. If you live in New York, where we voted not only this time, but last time out nine to one against uh, this guy, uh, you know, you, we would know we know him as the great grifter for 40 years in public life. Uh, but in the rest of the country, he was only known as this kind of garbage uh, television personality. So what drives what drives an interest in voting for someone where uh, if you're, let's say, lower class in the United States, you have absolutely no class interests in common. Uh, that's fairly typical for the Republican Party, but it, it exploded with this particular candidate. What drives that? And uh, uh, if it's not going to be policies and it's not going to be or, or, if, or, or if the policy interests even run against you, the only thing I land on is it's something much deeper. OK. Uh, and there's something much deeper is what social psychologists uh, would refer to as affiliation, high affiliation for authority, right? George Orwell, uh, writing in the late 1940s, referred to that as bully worship. And um, I don't know if that's come by uh, nature or it's come by nurture, uh, but somehow uh, it seems that a very large number of uh, uh, fellow voters in this country have that kind of high authority affiliation. And just as we spoke about, uh, some uh, person or another spoke about uh, this earlier in our uh, meeting uh, today, uh, the, uh, the real uh, divide here seems to be between the people who have that sort of high uh, uh, authoritarian uh, affiliation. Well, we're at one minute. And, and, and those who don't. And um, uh, if that's the political divide, uh, I really uh, don't have a very, um, uh, optimistic thoughts about how to move forward. Done. Thank you very much, Saul. Uh, Rick, you're up next. Microphone, sir. Okay. Do we do we have lift yes. off? Fine. All right. So I wanted to uh, respectfully disagree with Mr. Martino um, about Biden's um, sort of presumptiveness and his his uh, proact pro proactive approach to uh, the aftermath of the election so far. I think, um, you know, given the sort of media consensus and the Maybe it's it's a close uh, divide between uh, numerically between Trump supporters and people that are convinced that it's that it's over. Mostly Democrats, obviously. But I think uh, it, it it would be um, you know starting off on a weak note for Biden to um, you know equivocate and wait for further results or anything like that. But I think more importantly. Um, I think we've got a real long-term problem, maybe I'm stating the obvious on our hands in terms of you've got, as was just said, uh, 71 million people, Republicans, I think it was 86% uh, last poll I read, uh, thinking that the election was indeed rigged. That's, that's really a huge divide. And there are many, many complex reasons for this that we all, I've talked about um, one telling comment uh, that I read was that if you were to boil down everything into one sentence uh, among the diverse voters that supported Trump and are now questioning the election, it's more of a, it's, it's, it's not so much of an anti-Biden thing personally, uh, it, it is um, this. This is this is this is the sentence that really caught my attention, and that is for for uh, a lot of a lot of Trump voters, it's it's a question of you look down on us. 
Now, that could be the heartland, it could be the working class, it could be lifelong Republicans of various stripes. But I think if there's one common theme, it is you, the meritocratic, democratic, professional, Brahmin, whatever you want to call it, class, looks down on these folks. That may be, in the eyes of most people here, foolish or, you know, in ver to various degrees, uh, naive, partisan. Uh, but I think there is some truth to that view. And I think that's why the needle that Biden has to thread uh, it, it, it is, is a very tricky one, very, na very narrow one. I think he can do it, but, um, you know, th this didn't begin with Trump. It didn't begin with, it, it, this, this divide goes back to, to Reagan uh, and, and that sharp right turn that was made in 1980, 80, 80, 81. So we've got a country, we've got to just face up to the existential reality without oversimplifying that we've got a country where you have the number of people in 2016 and 2020 that, uh, especially in 2020, after four years of this uh, person in the White House, uh, still, you know, were willing to cast their votes for him. And that's, that's a really, really maybe to state the obvious, it's a really, really tough nut. And it, it trickles down, of course, into the, into the two, two branches of Congress. And one more minute, Rick. Sense, yeah, one, one minute? One more minute, yes. Okay, so just, just to wrap up and not continue rambling, um, the fact that the Republicans uh, did so well in, in the House and the Senate compared with what was expected, I think is also disconcerting. And to just end on a cheery note in the last few seconds, I, I think Biden probably is the person for the Democratic Party that can figure this out in, in terms of person to person, uh, you know, better than any other single Democrat. Let's hope so. Thanks, Rick. We have Simone from Mercy College up next, but uh, right before that, I'd like to make a, a plea to the many students that have joined us. I see there's a lot of uh, uh, names from, from some of my classes to uh, please jump in with uh, any of your, your opinions and comments. We're particularly eager to hear from the younger generations. Uh, but uh, Simone, you're next. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Uh, greetings from the Bronx, New York. Um, my name is Simone Boyer and I am an adjunct professor at Mercy College. Uh, I thank you for having this. This is this is enlightening. This is pretty cool, especially hearing from our international uh, folks. Um, I don't want to go political. I also appreciate uh, the uh, candidness of people who um, were pollsters, or not pollsters, who went um, election day helpers. People went to the polls. Thank you for enlightening us and giving us a little viewpoint into what you experienced. Um, as a professor, I always try to get my students to go out and vote. I always try to tell them, look, your vote counts. Contrary to what anybody tells you, your vote counts, go do it. Many people have died in the past for this luxury, for this right. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the United States don't care, okay? Oh my God, it's raining. I'm not going out to vote, all right? Oh my God, I, I got so much stuff to do. I can't go out to vote. I am very glad that many people in the United States did go out and vote this time for this election. However, I think we need to change. Why is it that we get usually more people voting for The Voice, American Idol, whatever on TV, but they won't go out and vote for a president or for a representative who will affect their lives. And this is what I tell my students. I'm like, people don't go out and vote for somebody who will make a law 
you know, the people on The Voice or the people on American, they, they're not going to affect your, your, your life. So go and make, go and vote in the important election. But I think that with COVID and with everything that happened, it made it easier because of the mail-in ballots and because, you know, like you said, somebody, you know, could pull up and vote on an iPad. I think we need, we as the United States electoral process needs to change because you know, and I, and, and I understand it. I, I you know, I, I tried, like I said, I tried to talk with my students and the electronic stuff, you know, hey, we're all on a, on a laptop. We're all on some type of electronic thing here. Why can't we vote that way? And I, and I understand, you know, hackers and everything else, you know, hell, some people couldn't have a good Zoom, you know, because people were, were Zoom bombing. Iron that out. And this way you will get more participation. You will get people who want to vote instead of people who are like, eh, I don't feel like voting today. Like I said, it's raining. Uh, I got too much to do. Uh, I got some excuse, whatever excuse. And also, I think this will help eliminate or help alleviate when somebody doesn't want to vote because they're, where they have to poll is across town. Oh my God, I got to go in and grab, you know, grab the bus or grab the subway or whatever, get in my car and go someplace. So I think that, like I said, with COVID, a silver lining, if there was one, it, it gave a different way for us to vote. It presented a different way for us to vote. And I think that from here on out, we need to like look at that and look at how we can improve our way of voting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simone. And it looks like um, uh, one of our students uh, is willing to step up and, 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 and talk. So Vola, you have the floor now. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Vola. I'm an international student. So obviously, I did not vote <laughs> because I can't. But I've been observing it because it's something that, you know, I, I love politics. I, I have this civic uh, commitment. If I could vote here, I would. I'm hoping that I can vote for my country's election soon in 2022. Um, and what I wanted to say was that what I've observed is that people here in the US don't necessarily care to vote, either because politics are so hard to understand for them, um, especially in places like rural places where they don't necessarily have an access to college education. Uh, I have some friends who did not go vote because they didn't understand what was the platform of both candidates. Um, and then what I also noticed is that um, it's not mandatory here. In Europe and also in Australia, I've, I've read about this, if you don't go to vote, you get a fine. And that actually makes people willing to understand what politics are about and they go vote and they try to make their voices heard. Uh, something I also noticed is that here, in the US, election day is not a holiday. I understand that back in the days with, you know, back in the, the founding fathers days, um, it was put on a Tuesday so that people could go to church and then the electors could travel on the Monday to be able to vote in DC. I feel like today with everything that's going on and also like the, the rise of population, it would be nice to have election day to be a holiday because it would, you know, you wouldn't have any problem to go out during work and get sanctioned by your employer if it were a holiday. And um, I think it would help a lot for uh, voting turnout, although I'm, I'm glad that people went to vote. I was really happy. But compared to what I've seen in other first world countries, it's definitely not enough, in my opinion. I, I know I'm, you know, it's an international point of view. It's not how things are done in the US, but that's, that's my observation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vola. I don't know if you know it, but a lot of the comments that have been bouncing around in the, uh, in the chat have been to the effect of what you were saying, considering uh, uh, making it a holiday or mandatory. So some very interesting points and thanks for, for jumping in. Um, okay, so at, yes, Lucio, of course, you, you can go next. Well, I'm worried because uh, I am not voting since something like 20 years. 
Uh, I remember last time I went to vote was in the 90s. So I really don't know what is going to happen when I go back to Italy. I hope I'm not going to pay any fine. I didn't know that we were paying fine in Italy if we were not voting. And uh, so, when? but the problem for me is not how to force or to push, how to have the people going to vote because we already saw 160, about 160 million of people went to vote now in the US out of 230 that was possible. It's already a huge number. I don't really think that we have to worry about how to make this happen. What we have to worry is how to avoid that uh, large part of the other party doesn't trust the outcome of the elections. This happened four years ago. Uh, Democrat didn't really recognize in Trump the president of all the Americans. And now it's happening the other, the, the opposite. The, Demo, the Republicans are not recognizing Biden as a legitimate winner. And um, I, maybe I've been misunderstood before. I, 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 Trump has never, in, never talked about himself like a unifier. Uh, maybe the last Republican who was talking about himself like as a unifier was the youngest Bush. But then Trump never wants to unify the country in a way. He's always a divider. He almost looks proud to be a divider. But Biden talks about unifying the country. And so far, I stress the point that doesn't look like he's caring about how the Republicans are looking at his victory. And uh, Bush and Gore waited 37 days. And we are not waiting 37 days in this moment. So. Um, I, I, all this to say that I don't really believe that Biden lost the election and that the election has been stolen by Biden. No, that's not the point. The point is, what do you do with the people who doesn't believe in the legitimacy of the electoral process? And I really don't see any progress in this. That's all for now. Thank you. Thanks, Lucio. And um, we'll have a time for questions and answers after Argent, uh, Federico Argentieri wraps up with um, some concluding remarks. So if you do have questions for individual speakers, please keep them for that, uh, that time. Um, in the meantime, we have one more student, Adair Martinez, that would like to speak. Adair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Albrecht. Um, my name is Adair Martinez. I am a senior right now at Mercy College's very own in, uh, international relations and diplomacy program. And I agree with many of you and with others, I you know, still try to wrap my head around these statements. I am not sure too much what to think on the matter. Um, but I have, from observations here at home in New York City's five boroughs, and then living in the most Republican one, the most uh, right-wing one, uh, I witnessed the loss of a local who, ident who identifies himself or used to identify himself as an army veteran, a congressman named Max Rose. Um, I saw that he lost his election due to pure political association as he it was identified as a Democrat and the election was close with his um, uh, opposition being Nicole Meliotakis, a Republican uh, assemblywoman uh, for the Congressional District of Staten Island and Southern Brooklyn. Um, and it's interesting to see how there was a sort of like culture behind um, the Republican support that this Congresswoman received and how just using the the absolute like name alone of Trump on her um, political um, campaign signs got her the win that she needed against a congressman who, even though he was Democrat, used the American Army sign as his campaign, um, you know, logo. And witnessing like the Trumpian administration, how it like lost um, American leadership and degraded American leadership abroad, um, how it put many Americans in a state of uncertainty overseas and at home. The leadership, the leadership showed absolute carelessness towards the welfare and the lives of millions and billions, not just towards the foreigners, but to the safety and the security of many American nationals. Internally, here in the United States, the supporters of the president who 
majorly consist of supporters from the southern states and the Midwest have felt the full brunt of the social and economic maneuvers of the uh, administration. And it seems that the elections become gradually like um, Miss, uh, one of the speakers from Mercy College uh, with the name SB. Um, it seems that the elections do in fact gradually become less focused on governance and become more of a American Idol entertainment and preference matter. As we have seen in previous years with John F. Kennedy, who was the youngest president who received favorability due to him being young, him being from the, uh, the uh, very prominent political family. And then we have Ronald Reagan, who was previously a, uh, a TV um, idol or a star or he was known as the great communicator. Uh, and then we have uh, the current um, president, President Trump, who was a TV entertainer as well. Um, I, as a young person, I do not wish to associate myself with uh, any political party due to this culture that exists behind it and the type of uh, pressures that follow you with it. Um, so there's a, there's a cult or a culture in American politics which uh, pushes young people and many non-voters away. However, this year we noticed that a lot of young people came out to vote as well as uh, newly naturalized American citizens. Um, and many families currently uh, identify in my hometown at least, and maybe across the country identify with a political party or affiliation as they do- One minute, Adair. As they do or would with their religious identity as we, as we have witnessed. And I feel like it is essential to maintain our government institutions secular rather than utilize as mechanisms to dictate how people should live their personal life. That is all I have to share. And I thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you there. Very well, well said. John, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. And uh, thank everybody for being here. Um, my name is John Gonzalez. I am a student at Mercy College. I also study international relations with the DARE. Uh, a little bit about me. I am a 12-year military vet. I did nine years active duty. Um, <clears throat> I served places uh, across the U.S., Iraq, and Korea uh, for my overseas campaigns. After military service, I worked at NOAA in the Homeland Security Office. Uh, I also worked inside the RNC. And uh, reserves at Fort Meade. So I want to say that from what I've seen, I've seen a lot from many different perspectives. Um, and this election to me was more in regards to uh, out with the old, in with the new. Uh, maybe I'm saying that wrong, but it is the power structures to be holding on for dear power. And we know that come the future generations, things like the ethnic diversity is going to increase here in the U.S., um, that the power structure is going to shift probably more left to more liberal ideas because the younger generation is is frankly more liberal uh they are, haven't exactly been exposed to the ways of the older generation which is possibly a good thing um which uh, you know is a good thing um and we're seeing that across the board. I also worked inside of the Census Bureau. So I know that here in the metropolitan areas, we're gonna lose a lot of representation. And that is, you know, we take, we're focusing here on the election, but we're not taking into consideration the other layers of the onion that, you know, that kind of feed, it, feed us. So, um, you know, we're run by, we're governed by the states. The United States 
However, we're trying to attack this issue with like this uh, centralized minds, mindset that, um, you know, it's, it's how we vote that we're doing it wrong, which is, is almost definitely the case, but we're just coming at ICA from the wrong angle. These uh, the state politics, you know, how we want to apply our state politics and federal politics should be reevaluated uh, moving forward, I guess. Uh, I'll take that as my time. I apologize Thanks, John. If, I, we have... if I wasn't as clear. No, no need to apologize. Thanks. Thanks a lot. We have a, an, another student, Lushima, and then I'd like to give the floor again to um, to Rick and Eric after Lushima. Lushima, you're next. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Uh, good afternoon to all. I am currently a junior at Mercy College as well. Uh, my major is also in IRDP. And I would just like to make a comment or just make a comment the people who went to the poll worker the polls and did their job because it was very it was a very very important time and also I would like to say as well from my perspective or from my opinion or from my vision is that this global pandemic has opened maybe would have been like a silver line although we've lost a lot of lives it was an eye opening because it showed the legitimacy and the authenticity, um, the real, the real, of what the institutions that are to govern and put in place politics or during the elections, they are not clear or unclear, and they ridiculed or whether or not they probably sabotage in whatever sense may be, and as well, especially the more people who voted this were the youth because I never cared about elections because I didn't see it as important. It was boring. It was like for the older generation. But once we saw what was on the line because of the type of person who was in power, for example, Trump and the rights of LGBTQ, feminism, everything was on the line for not only of all classes, all diversities, everyone were basically in trouble. That meant something to us. So in that way, we spoke up by going to the to the po um, polls and vote. And I was happy because we didn't want this man in power for another four years because he did damage already. And it's like, and I don't associate with any. I'm an independent. Vo I'm an independent um, voter. Basically, who I think should be able or should be put in place to run the country and can do it, that's who I think should be put in place. It's not a matter of Democrats or Republicans, but I think whoever should be in power and who knows how, who knows their way around that should be, um, should be there. So that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Lushima. Rick, you had uh, some comments you wanted to make? Yes, just just very very briefly to bring things closer to home at Mercy College, uh, with uh, approximately ten thousand students, Saul or somebody might want to correct that if it's uh, inaccurate. But uh, approximately ten thousand students. It's remarkable, Eduardo. I'd be curious about your take as a fellow international relations professor that so few sections of political science are offered at Mercy. The college does almost nothing at the administrative, the advertising, the infrastructure support for building, uh, you know, supporting uh, political science, uh, citizenship, uh, international relations courses. We have to fight to get these things to run. And so, you know, starting with, with our own institution, I think, we have some work to do. We had a, we had a political science major for about uh, 20 years that I started in the mid 80s and it was terminated in toward the, toward the end of the last century by a provost that was all about numbers. And we, we had you know 30, 35 students, uh, 40 students perhaps in the major that were among the top students in the college, student government, 
editor of the newspaper, go, you know, working for the CIA, getting careers in the State Department and, and so on. So I think, you know, for all of us here that are affiliated with this college and, and you know, we, we have some work to do. I, I put our heads together to, 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 to build knowledge here. Thanks, Rick. Eric, you're up next. Sure. Uh, I'd just like to go back very briefly to something that uh, Lucio Martino said earlier. Uh, Lucio and I uh, often agree on things, most often agree on things. I do have a little different take uh, from his on differences and similarities between 2016 and 2020. Um, I don't, I, I'm not convinced that there is a close analogy between the action of the Democrats in 2016 and of the Republicans now in 2020 with respect to the electoral results. Uh, I would argue that in 2016, Hillary Clinton probably should have conceded a bit earlier than she did, but it was not a long delay. And it seems to me that the, um, the questions that the Democrats, you know, were raising and have continued to raise uh, about Trump's victory in 2016 was that sort of disconnect between the popular vote, a very serious disconnect between the popular vote and the electoral college vote. Of course, what counts is the electoral college vote. We know this, but I, I think the, I think a lot of the frustration, if you will, was was there. I think it is materially different what the uh, Republican, the Republican approach at present, uh, which is uh, in essence to question the institutions, to question the process, to launch uh, very uh, powerful accusations of, of corruption in the process, uh, which uh, you know, I think is, is a new element to certainly uh, the analogy between Democrats in 2016, Republicans in 2020 seems to me to be an imperfect one. Thank you very much, Eric. We have some follow-up comments by Conrad. Yes, thank you. I think the uh, point of view I'm about to express may not be universally popular here on this, uh, on this particular chat, but the reality is when I hear a lot of participants express bewilderment and horror that over 70 million uh, Americans voted for Trump, I think again, this is focusing on a cultural point of view and less so on what may have mattered to these Americans. And I think it's important that to be fair, we take into account how successful the economy was before we were struck by COVID and how many people did find their standard of living raised. They did have additional employment and they were doing better. So some people may very well have yearned for that to return and may not have as much confidence that the Democrats would have been able to bring the economy back. That's what surveys consistently showed that, well, whether you believe polls or not, we know that a lot of them were quite wrong, but they showed that although Trump did not have the confidence of the electorate when it came to COVID-19, he did have confidence uh, of the electorate with respect to the economy and potentially bringing the economy back. And then I think the Democrat party itself has focused to some extent on the lack of a blue wave being attributable to an overly progressive message that it pushed. And there's been some soul searching within the Democrat party itself. So for instance, defund the police, which is not popular, regardless of the neighborhood that it's in overall, it may have people marching in the streets, but when they do the surveys of people living uh, in those neighborhoods, they do not approve of it. And there was definitely an effect on the electorate. Uh, for example, the young man from uh, clearly from Staten Island, because he talked about Max Rose and Nicole Maliotakis, the rise of uh, Republican uh, assembly people for the New York, in the New York State Senate, as well as uh, in Suffolk County, in Nassau County, and on Staten Island is directly attributable to the breakdown of law and order in the city of New York and the voters were reacting to that. So I think that if folks wanna understand the other side, if you will, if you have a divide of 70 million versus 75 million, if you wanna understand the other side, you have to sometimes attribute the best motivations potentially to those folks as to what was motivating them. Not necessarily because they're the antithesis of what you believe in, 
but because they too wanted something that was good for their families and good for the country. And I would say the same thing when Republicans look at Democrats, that the vast majority of Democrats just want what's best for the country and are equal patriots. And that's how we have to look at each other. So that's one thing I would say. I just got the sense too many people here are sort of horrified and look at Republicans who voted for Donald Trump as an alien species for another planet. And I will tell you that I am one of those folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Conrad. I dream of a world in which speakers don't have to qualify their opinions as popular or unpopular before they talk. So I appreciate you, um, you, you intervening. Um, we have another student, Kiara McAllister. Would you like to go next? Sure, I just wanted to make a point that I'm, I like hearing a lot of different people's perspective on uh, things and their views. Um, and, but I also feel like there, even though there's a really big divide, no one really talks about how people, the people that feel like in the middle compared to things like no one talks about like, let, let's say if you're a Democrat, but you don't really believe in the extreme leftist views that they have, or if you're a Republican, you don't necessarily agree with the far right reviews and you don't agree with um, not everything is white supremacy or racism. And then the left, not everything is you being a social justice warrior or things like that. Um, but I definitely think the divide is huge and I definitely feel it because I used to consider myself part of one party, but then when I got, uh, I went back to school and I started learning, um, my political views definitely shifted. Uh, reading things, learning things, I think the media also plays into that too. It shifts my political views, but I also don't feel like people don't look at it like if you identify as one party, you don't necessarily agree with a bunch of things that they might talk about or what they're saying. Um, so I feel like if you're centered or if you're kind of saying like, oh, I, I consider myself this, but I don't agree with this views, then that party looks at you like, how dare you? Um, it's like very judgmental. And then they kind of think like, well, if you're not completely with us, you're against us. And then the other side, if you don't agree with what they think, then it, it's just like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, I just feel like nobody really, um, not nobody, but uh, there's not really talk about the people that feel like they're in the middle. Like you can definitely be like this, but be like, I don't agree with defund policing or I don't agree with this and that. But then if you don't agree with that, then it's like you get judged for it or it's like a really big divide. But I, I think it's really interesting um, to think about. But I also like everybody's different perspectives. I like what they had to say. Um, and yeah, that's really it. Great. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for expressing your opinions. I wanted to make sure we had enough time to allow Professor Argentieri to, uh, to, to uh, give his concluding remarks. And then after those, if there's anybody who thinks of questions they would like to ask to specific speakers, please do send me a message in the chat, and I'm happy to hand over the floor for that. So, um, uh, Federico, over to you. Well, actually, I understood that uh, I would have uh, uh, spoken after the question and answer period. Uh, actually, I think it's it's better this way. So let, let's have uh, some questions, uh, answer them, and then uh, in the next, we have seven minutes actually because I I would take uh, five minutes for my speech like you, and uh, let's have uh, questions and answers uh, over the next five minutes. Angela, you're up next. Wait, I wasn't going to talk. <laughs> I have nothing more to say at the moment. Thanks. Oh, sorry, I misread the, uh, the the name. There's a lot of there's a lot of names that are are shortened, and there's a person called Anna Angle, and I thought that was Angela. Sorry, <laughs> I apologize for 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 putting you in a spotlight like that, Angela. So, Anna Angle, you're next. Hi, uh, hi everyone. My name is Anna. I am a junior at Mercy College. I'm an international business program. And I guess I just wanted to touch on the very first speaker, Diego. Um, he spoke about asking when a new era of reform will begin. And I think as um, I went to a speech um, prior that Mercy College put on and the speaker talked about how a society becomes more complex uh, we become more susceptible to malfunction. And so our parties are becoming so complex and fractured where people don't even know what they actually affiliate with. So kind of like what Adir said, so people follow a culture of not affiliating to any political party or they feel forced to 
pick one side or the other because we need we've put ourselves in a position where we have to value things over the other and kind of disregard an entire side in order to kind of get our agenda forward. So our society is becoming too complex in order for it to function properly as, as it had um, originally. And we need a strong reform um, in order to function properly. And perhaps this is the time to do it. And it might be scary. And as one of the speakers said, um, it might, be, it might be scary, but it's something that I think we finally reached in, in the day and age that we have to face. Things like the Electoral College that does not make sense. A uh, two-party system that doesn't represent um, the people in, in, in a correct way or the legal protection of the president to, that does not make sense at all. Um, I'm not saying that they never worked, but we cannot use the same system for the rest of time. So we're in a very fragile moment and the chaos that's presenting itself right now between far-winged parties and groups is natural when the system is outdated and it doesn't represent our modern day. So I just wanted to say that, I mean, it's it's a scary thing and seeing such a divide, 70 million to 75 million, which I, which we can probably see in our own backyards happening. It's scary, but it's something that, that, that just happens to any system or any organism that becomes too too chaotic, too complex in itself. So I don't know. I just, I, it's a natural thing, although very morbid natural thing. So thanks. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Anna. And I'd like to thank all the students who've uh, stepped up and, and expressed their opinions. I think that's a very good sign for the future generations. Um, at this point, we, we have nobody lined up to speak. So um, uh, Federico, if okay with you, maybe you, yes. uh, you have yes, a little please. bit more wiggle room for your remarks. Yes, uh, actually, it's better to leave a party with a willingness to stay than to be bored. So uh, I think we'll uh, cut it uh, in, uh, in a few minutes, and uh, I think we'll be all eager to have had more. But um, uh, my point is related to the role of the United States in the world. Uh, foreign policy has been absent from this discussion. Uh, understandably, because uh, it was focused on the election. Uh, but we, there is something that I would like to draw your attention on. I agree with, uh, uh, with most of what uh, was said. I, I, I also happen to agree with, uh, uh, um, with Conrad uh, and uh, the colleague uh, who spoke uh, in, uh, uh, and Saul. Who are close to one another in my on my screen. Uh, I there was a reason, uh, a part of reason in both uh, in both uh, speeches, and uh, I completely endorse uh, their position. Uh, not their political, not both political positions, but uh, the the reason and the, their arguments. Uh, the U.S. in the world uh, now. Uh, I think the Trump presidency has. Uh, possibly deliberately revealed that something that was lingering in the air uh, ever since uh, uh, the early years of the century, that the United States are no longer what they used to be. Uh, they're no longer what they used to be, that is the superpower, the only superpower left, which they have been certainly for the first 15 years, at least uh, after the end of the Cold War. And there has been something interesting that has revealed this. Uh, in, for example, take it in uh, the late 1990s, no country of the 193 who are members of the UN, uh, no country would have dared not congratulate an elected US president. Now we have several who wait to congratulate because they want to see how uh, the, the situation evolves. And the situation uh, will evolve most probably, not in the sense that uh, Secretary of State Pompeo said uh, yesterday or the day before, that is a smooth transition towards uh, the second uh, <clears throat> Trump presidency. I express some doubts in this respect. But the fact that uh, Putin, Xi in China, Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, and uh, other uh, heads of state with a certain kinship with one another are not yet uh, 
have not yet expressed their positions uh, uh, regarding the election. That is, they have not saluted the, the new elected president, because that's what Biden uh, has been, unless uh, proof, uh, clear proof of uh, uh, vote fraud uh, is being uh, displayed. But it is uh, uh, appropriate to be a little skeptical about that. So uh, the role of the United States in the world uh, has uh, moved from being the superpower to being one of the various great powers, one of the various players, and it's a multipolar world. It's a multipolar world with uh, China certainly importantly uh, on the rise, but not necessarily against the United States. I mean, this idea of the rivalry between China and the United States uh, is uh, uh, doubtful. Uh, if the United States, of course, uh, criticized China sharply uh, with regards to human rights uh, in Hong Kong uh, and elsewhere, then uh, yes, the rivalry can increase. But if the United States uh, don't uh, and just uh, uh, identify China as the source uh, of the COVID-19, that is not likely to, to last very long because either evidence is, is shown that uh, China is indeed the birthplace of COVID-19 and the COVID-19 was spread worldwide deliberately by the Chinese authorities or there is no point in this discussion. So the complexity of the situation has been made clear, I think, uh, by the Trump administration by the foreign policy of the Trump administration. I credit Trump of not having started new conflicts. Yes, this is not something to be underestimated. Uh, and uh, people are never happy to go to war. With all due, due respect for the John, the veteran who spoke earlier on, I also have tremendous respect uh, for him and uh, his uh, colleagues. Uh, uh, but I'm sure he's also uh, sharing the feeling that it's better to not go to war than to go to war, or it's better to not have to go to war than to go to war. So we need to think, and I think American voters, even though they're not always interested in foreign policy, should uh, think uh, about this, uh, which is an inevitable process, irrespective of Trump. Trump only made it uh, visible to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Federico. We have uh, three more minutes left. Would anybody like to make um, a, a last minute remark? Um, okay. In that case, I would like to thank everyone for coming and being here. And in particular, I wanted to point out the anti-hierarchical format that we experimented today and how well I think it went. Um, we're accustomed to going to, to panels, particularly in the era of Zoom. There seems to be a mushrooming of, of these types of events. But uh, I, I would like to credit Professor Argentieri with the idea to do this in a kind of open mic town hall way, which I think was, um, was far more democratic, especially given the, the topic. It uh, seems to dovetail nicely. So thank you for, for having this idea, um, uh, Argentier, Federigo. Thank you, uh, every, all the advisors from the Guarini Institute for, for joining. Thank you, uh, Saul and Michiko from the Center of Global Engagement for, for making it happen, and especially for promoting it um, across the board at Mercy College. I, I don't know how many people are here, but it looks like there's at least uh, 70 50. or 80. 50? Uh, yeah, the, the screen says 50, but maybe there's more. I don't know. 50, which seems like a, a very good good turnout to me. Absolutely. So, so um, um, you know, perhaps we don't have a political science major at Mercy College, Rick, but we do have a fervent civic engagement uh, community that uh, is evidenced by uh, events like these. So again, thanks to everyone. And without further ado, I bid you farewell. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.